Hey everyone, long time no see. So for those of you who were watching my videos last year, you may remember I started a project and then just went radio silent. Basically, when I started to build the thing, didn't really seem like it was turning out how I wanted. So I just decided to cut my losses and ended up taking the videos down because it just didn't make sense to have half a project on YouTube. Uh, so anyway, with that behind us, it's new year, new system and new series of videos uh, in which I'm not going to be building the system from scratch because as you can see, I've already built it, but I will be tweaking, modifying, improving, testing, demonstrating, you know, all that stuff just to see how good I can make this DML based system. This is not a completed project. Think of this as like a, a starting point. So basically what I've built here is a system for primarily listening to music, but I also run the TV through it. Uh, it's a 2.2 system. So two main speakers, which are the panels and 0.2 being the two subwoofers you can see in the corners here. This varies a little bit from previous builds I've done where I've really done my best to make a all in one speaker, sort of integrate the tone woofers with the panels and just make a sort of a single tower. Initially, I did that just to save space because I'm listening in a fairly small room. But this time around, I just decided, whatever, I'm just going to build what I need to build to get the best sound. So as you can see, the system is kind of spreading out along the back wall here. Okay, so this is basically a digital system. I run two sources, the first being the television and the second being a Weem Pro streaming unit that's in the cabinet here, uh, generally using Spotify Connect through that for music. Both digital sources, and they both run into the Mini DSP Flex here, which at the moment I'm just using as a sort of a preamp, selecting the source, controlling the volume. It also has Dirac room correction built in. Uh, I'll be playing with that later, but I'm not going to get into that before I'm completely happy with everything else in the system. From there, the digital signal continues. It's got digital outputs as well. So Toslink cables connect that to the pair of plate amplifiers you can see on the floor there. This is the Hypex FA503. It has two by 500 watt amplifier modules plus a 100 watt tweeter module in it as well. Now the Hypex has its own DSP built in and I'm using that to control crossovers, uh, crossover cutoff frequency, slope, time aligning the mains and the subs, that basic stuff. If I also use the DSP in here, it'll just be a little sprinkling of magic over the top of hopefully an already good sounding system. Now I will go into more detail about each part of this system in future videos, but for now, I'm just going to give a bit of information about each kind of aspect of the system. So let's jump in and have a look at the DML panel speakers first off. Okay. We'll start with the mains because that's probably why you're watching, uh, DML panels from acrylic. So once again, this is three millimeter thick acrylic and I've got it fairly rigidly attached to a wooden frame. So the four corners are rigid as in it's a hard plastic bracket and the, the panel is not exactly screwed in, but it's clamped very tightly against that. The ones in the middle are slightly different. They are a slightly more flexible material. So there's just a little bit more give in the middle of the panel there. The main reason for having the attachment points in the middle isn't so much to hold rigidity. It's just to stop the panel from bowing in and out, uh, which they tend to do. So obviously if it's bowing inwards, then it's putting more pressure on the exciter. If it's bowing outwards, then it's trying to separate itself from the exciter. And neither one of those is particularly desirable. If we turn this around, you can 
see some more details of the construction. So obviously dual exciters here. Uh, once again, I'm using the Dayton thruster 40 watt exciters. So two in series, 80 watts per channel of power handling and just hidden cabling from the front. And then as you can see, I've got them braced, uh, which I haven't done in the past. So the brace serves two purposes. The first is that over time, you picture the panel with the exciter on it like that. Um, the exciter, if it has to support its own weight, it could start to sag and pull the voice coil out of alignment. I don't think that's a huge uh, concern with these thruster exciters because they're not that heavy. Uh, but nevertheless, it, for peace of mind, um, I think that's better just to brace it. The other thing that this does is, you know, obviously these things work by vibrating and some of the energy is going to get used by vibrating the body of the exciter itself. We don't really want that. We want all the energy or as much as possible to go into the panel and vibrate that. So by attaching the exciter to a brace like this, it basically stops that back and forward movement of the body of the exciter so that more of that energy can be focused into the panel. Now I have tried measuring this, like the difference between braced and unbraced before, and I'll admit that I haven't actually um, got measurable results where it shows a clear difference between one and the other. Nevertheless, uh, it feels like it's a better way to do it. So I haven't permanently attached the exciters to the brace. It's just some sort of gummy foam double-sided tape uh, that's sticking those together, but it's perfectly strong enough to do both of those jobs. On the other side of the exciter, I'm actually using these new detachable ones from Dayton where the exciter itself has got an internal thread which attaches to a little plastic puck. And it's actually that puck which adheres to the panel. If you want to take this off and use it somewhere else or attach it to a different panel, you can just unscrew it, buy a new puck, and stick that on a new panel. Um, I'll put the details in the notes here or, or something. I can't remember what they call it. Uh, all right, so moving on. Follow the wiring down. I've got a 3D printed binding post bracket here. Two sets of binding posts. Um, this is obviously going into the exciters. There's another pair here because I'm considering whether I should attach a tweeter to this speaker or not. Um, perhaps sit a planar tweeter or just another small BML panel on top to handle high frequencies. Um, I've built that in so I can add it if I want to, but I haven't decided yet since it doesn't really sound deficient in high frequency. The brackets. So originally I just 3D printed some brackets out of PLA, which is just a rigid plastic. I think they're strong enough. I don't have kids or pets or anything running around the house, so it's not like these were, are in danger of being knocked over or anything. But I decided to add these right angle steel brackets just because they add obviously more strength, but also quite a lot of weight at the bottom here. So if that does get bumped in either direction, it's, it's not going anywhere. Without those brackets, it's just obviously more likely to tip since it's not bottom heavy like that. Uh, I've also 3D printed these feet out of PLA for the gold part and then TPU for the, the actual foot there, which is a softer material, a little bit gummy in this case. The subwoofers are 12 inch units. And as you can see, the enclosure isn't huge. So I'm using sealed boxes at around about 50 liters internal volume each. And when left to their own devices, those aren't going to put out a huge amount of bass. My plan is to use the headroom that I have with the, uh, the 500 watt amp in a fairly small room to EQ more low end into the bass. So I haven't gone too far into, into that, but I do have a low end boost running now. And the initial results are really promising. Uh, nice bass goes down pretty deep, 
haven't measured it yet, but uh, it's, it's good. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, I'm really looking forward to getting that dialed in in the future even better. Now, in addition to wanting to play the subwoofers low, I also want to play them pretty high. And the reason for that is DML panels sound better when you don't put low frequency uh, signal into them. If you're messing around with panels and you haven't tried that yet, I 100% recommend that you do it. I can almost guarantee that there'll be a noticeable difference in the quality of the sound coming out of those panels. It does seem that low frequency signal just sort of overwhelms the panel somehow. I don't know the exact mechanism, but you know, uh, in my own experience in measuring and listening and building these things, um, that's definitely been the case. So I knew from the start that I wanted to offload as much low frequency content as possible to a dedicated driver. In this case, it's the sealed subs. So as, as well as pushing them down to below 30 Hertz, I'm crossing them over quite high at 150 cutoff. Um, they've got a 24 decibel per octave slope uh, where they hand over to the panel, which at the moment is also 24 per octave the other way. So by the time they get down to like minus 50 or technically minus 48 decibels, 600 hertz out of the subwoofer. So these cones aren't going to break up at that point. The manufacturer says it's around 1,000 hertz for cone breakup. Um, so that's okay, but you do run into the issue of localization, i.e. as the frequency gets higher, our brains can more easily tell where it's coming from. So you picture a subwoofer that's just playing the very deepest frequencies only. It could be anywhere in the room, and you can't point to it with your eyes closed and, and say, oh, that's where it is. But as soon as it gets above like that 80 to 100 hertz kind of level, it becomes easier for a blindfolded person to you know, point, okay, the bass is coming from over there. You don't want that, obviously. You want it to sound like all the sound is coming from the same place. Yeah. So as you can see, I've got these in the corners, make a straight line from the listening position there, and they're basically all lined up, or close enough. One thing that I will try going forward is adding some sort of uh, high frequency or tweeter type component to this system. I've, as you saw, I've got the uh, amplification for it. I've got the binding posts and everything ready to go. Uh, I was going to do it already, but then when I started listening to the system, it sounded pretty good and I can't really detect any missing high frequency. Um, I might try it just because I like doing things like that. Um, and it may even be just a really small DML panel with small exciters and then another crossover between the main panel and the other panel. I'm not sure yet, but It'll be interesting to try. Uh, okay, I think that's about it for the, the system overview. Uh, I'm not gonna go on for too long today. As I said, I'll be covering each of these kind of topics in more detail in a future video, as well as um, throwing a heap of stuff at the system, uh, trying out new construction things, maybe some side wings, some tweeters, things like that, uh, and also playing around with the software, i.e. DSP, adjusting crossovers and all that kind of stuff. And I'm gonna share all that as part of this video series. So if that does happen to sound interesting to you, please subscribe and check out the future videos. Uh, I'll leave you now with a bit of music. Uh, I'm sorry to those people who always complain about using YouTube royalty-free music. Um, I'll do a proper video once it's all complete and I'll play actual, you know, nice music through the system but for now i just want you to hear that it works and you know sounds all right so i'll put something on see you next time